Welcome everyone to the annual Halperin Lecture. I'm Professor Danny Filk, I'm Associate Dean and Senior Lecturer in the Political Science Department, and I'll be the Master of Ceremonies for today's event. The Alperin family has, been a long, a long, has long been a friend of Van Guren University, and with their great vision, they have accompanied us throughout the years in understanding the various needs of the university and its students. With a mindful conscience and bountiful goodwill, they have realized and brought to life initiatives that truly make a difference. Whether it's shaping the leaders of tomorrow with a great social conscience or carving research opportunities for our faculty, the focus has always been about how we take what we learn and give back to society. I would now like to introduce Professor Daphne Hacker, our keynote speaker today and winner of this year's Michelle Halperin's Memorial Prize. Professor Daphne Hacker is an associate professor at the Tel Aviv University Law Faculty and Women and Gender Studies program. She will speak on the topic of legalized families in the era of border globalization. The committee has been unanimous in appreciating the excellence of her research. Professor Hacker combines in her work the fields of law studies and sociology, focusing mainly on contemporary families in a global world. Professor Hacker has an impressive record of published research. Her last book, Legalized Families in the Era of Border Globalization, was published by the prestigious Cambridge University Press Global Law Series and won the Law and Society Association 2018 Award for Best Book in Law and Society. Her book, and I quote, explores the interrelations between globalization, borders, families, and the law. The book analyzes the role of international, multinational, and religious laws in shaping the lives of the millions of families facing the interaction between the opportunities and challenges created by globalization and the resilience of national and cultural borders." Unquote. Among other topics, Professor Hacker's research includes the ways in which Israeli courts conceptualize mothers and families, a feminist critique of the ways in which the courts relate to divorce and children tenure, gender aspects of labor law, the global context of surrogate motherhood, and more. In accord with the spirit of Michelle Halperin, Professor Hacker's research builds on a deep commitment to human rights, emphasizing women's rights, and a passionate engagement with the law. Moreover, and not less important, Professor Hacker's research is not enclosed in the proverbial ivory tower, but is deeply engaged with society. Her work influences both policy and the law. She's an example of how to combine excellent academic research with civic responsibility and involvement in civil society, as exemplified by the fact that she was a founding member of ITAH, Jurist for Social Justice, an NGO working to promote the rights of women from underprivileged groups. For all these reasons, the committee was unanimous in selecting Professor Hacker as the recipient of the 2019 Michelle Halperin's Prize for Academic Excellence. I would now like to invite Lionel Halperin and Hester Halperin to, and Professor Daphne Hacker on stage for the awarding of the 2019 Michel Halperin Memorial Prize. Congratulations, Professor Halperin. <laughs> Daphne, the floor is yours. I'm so honored and pleased to be here. It's such a privilege. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ben Gurion University, the Department of Politics and Government, Professor Danny Filk. Thank you, Esther Lionel Halperin, for this wonderful opportunity to be here. Um, I heard such wonderful thing about Michel Halperin and his dedication to human rights in Israel and promoting democracy in Israel. And I think that his vision is more relevant today than ever before. I'm especially thankful for the committee uh, for mentioning not only my academic excellence, but also my commitment for social justice. Again, I think that more now, uh, maybe more so than in the past, we all as academics have an obligation to take part in public discourse and action and make sure that uh, there is a difference between fake news and rational information. Uh, between democracy as an empty shell of a uh, rude and cruel majoritarian uh, government or govern governmentality 
and not the sub substance of human rights to all. So I truly appreciate the award and the opportunity to be here. Today I will present to you, um, here we go, yes, uh, my book that Dani mentioned. Um, I will talk a bit about the general theoretical frameworks uh, and then delve into a specific um, chapter in the book that deals with hungry children. And while I'm talking, I'm inviting you all to think whether you are a part of what I would call globordered family. So keep this question in mind. I'm betting that most of you, if not all, are part of the phenomena that I'm going to talk about. And I want to start with the story that um, the book uh, starts with which is a story I uh, was exposed to watching a documentary film by HBO that calls uh, When Stranger Click. And it's the story of Barra Johnson, who is a Swedish uh, guy. He tries his luck in, um, in the US, doesn't work. He has to go back to this remote island uh, in, Sw in, in Sweden to live with his uh, elder mother. And he is bored. Like, it's so remote, there are no cars. You come with the boat and you walk on the island. So he enters this uh, uh, virtual sphere, Second Life. I don't know if any of you heard of it. It's, it's, it's a virtual world where people have avatars. And you see, for example, uh, uh, on the top, the real Ebara, And on the bottom, the Bara after the, he became an avatar in this imagined world, right? Um, so he's a singer, and his avatar creates this bar in which there are performances, and he plays his guitar in his mother's small kitchen, his real guitar, and his avatar is playing the music in this bar. And other avatars are coming to listen. And one of them is this gorgeous avatar, um, which... Um, starts to come and converse, and they fall in love. Her name is Nicole. They fall in love, and you can marry in Second Life if you pay very real $500 for the wedding, for the dresses, for the food, the imaginary food, uh, and they get married. One day, um, a guy enters this imagined bar and tells Bara, you know, I'm a real producer in New York. Come to New York, I will make you a record. You're a really good musician. Bara goes to, <laughs> to New York and says, well, if I'm already here and I know Nickel lives in Missouri, maybe I'll go and see my, well, okay, you're into it, my wife. Um, and they, uh, there he goes, it's the first time they actually see each other, and maybe that's why they got very drunk, um, and a real baby is born out of this evening, baby Christopher. So what we see here is the real Nicole watching in her computer a projection of the living room, of the imagined living room of Barra and Nicole in Second Life, watching the pictures of real babe Christopher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what happened was that Bar, uh, that Barra uh, needed to go back to, to, to Sweden because the United States doesn't grant you a visa just because you have an American child. And Barra says, we are still family even though we are just in separate places. Nikol says, the countries don't make it easy for you to actually live with someone for a while to see if you want to get married <laughs> in reality. Okay, so this sounds like, you know, really bizarre and anecdotal case, but think about the reality of many, many, many babies born all over the world from an ova in one country, inseminated by sperm in a second country, to be implement implemented in the uterus of a third, of a woman from a third country through transnational surrogacy to be delivered for parents from a fourth country who paid for that baby. And that's going on right now. So how far is that scenario from this story? 
And what I will uh, try to uh, persuade you in, in, the, in the coming few seconds is that millions of families are affected by the interrelations between global forces and borders, geopolitical borders and social borders. And I uh, developed two concepts which I will talk about, legalized families and border globalization. But what I'm, I'm looking at is the impact of these interrelations be between globalization and borders on families through the lens of the law. So what I'm asking is what opportunities are open now to families because of border globalization? What are the difficulties, the challenges that border globalization creates? Uh, to families, and what role does the law play in shaping these opportunities and challenges? So when I'm talking about globalization, I'm talking about the very common understanding of the, the phenomena, the very intense movement of people, of capital, of messages, ideas across geopolitical borders. And when I you know, it was the 90s, the beginning of the third millennium. Globalization was all over. As academics, we couldn't escape it, right? Um, and it became this buzzword. Everything was about globalization. And two things bothered me with this concept. First is that the literature on globalization treats this phenomena as dealing only or mainly with the public sphere. So it's about diplomatic relations. It's about uh, global economy and nothing about families. And when I started to read, to write this book, I was surrounded with, with really tens of books on globalization and readers about globalization. And I looked in the index for family or families, nothing as if globalization has nothing to do with families. So that's one thing that bothered me. The other one is that maybe because I'm an Israeli, I see borders all the time. And I was afraid that the concept of globalization makes us think as if we live in this borderless world. And as academics, again, we, it's easy to be trapped because we are traveling a lot. But in fact, when I became aware of this new, relatively new discipline called border studies, we realized that we live in the era with the highest number of geopolitical borders ever in human history. And that only about 4% now of people live outside the country in which they were born. So many more people would have wanted to cross a border, but cannot do so. And within this community of border studies, we learn that Borders do matter a lot to people in everyday lives. And uh, indeed, this community, unlike the scholarship on globalization, is, is preoccupied with, with families. Borders are central, uh, geopolitical ones, but as, as also social boundaries. For example, it was clear that baby Christoph is staying with his mother, right? This is a gendered border, um, an economic border that will, uh, I will talk uh, a lot about today. So uh, another theme is that borders are relational, contextual, and dynamic, yet usually resilient. They are embedded in power relations, and they are always contested. And I want to give you a few examples of things that are happening around the world that demonstrate this interrelations between uh, globalization and borders. It's not only antagonist relations, it's also cooperation between nation states and global forces, and all kinds of, of hybridities like global bordered families. So for example, in the UK, about a third of Muslims in the UK marry according to Sharia law, religious law, and do not register under the law of the state, because they bring with them their traditions, their understanding of marriage and law. So in the eyes of the state, they are single. And Muslim women can find themselves, after what they perceive 20 years of marriage, to realize that they're not married at all in the eyes of the country they live in. Singapore, uh, about a third of Singaporean men want to import and do import brides from other Asian countries, raising the question, does the state has a right to prohibit its citizens from importing brides on such a mega scale? Denmark, this tiny country, become a major export of sperm to other 
countries, sometimes under the slogan, congratulation, it's a Viking, you know, echoing this racist notion of this transnational movement of, of, of genes. India, a fascinating case study of a country that stopped hyper-capitalist profits from transnational surrogacy. You can no longer travel to India for transnational surrogacy after you could have done that and people did it and Israelis did it all the time. What, what, what was going on there? Why did they start it? Why did they end it? Um, the US. Four and a half million children are US citizens because they were born on the land, which is very rare, but the US still has it. Trump resisted, but this is the Constitution. Yet, although they are US citizens, they are at risk of being deported or separated from their parents because they do not have a legal status. In the Philippines, and we'll go back to that, about nine million children live, live without at least one of their parents because they emigrated to another country to send remittances. And finally, thousands of what we call unaccompanied minors reaching the shores, for example, of Italy from Africa, from the Middle East. What should Italy do with these minors? Should they be adopted? Or how do, should we understand their familiar relations with the parents that sent them. So these are just examples of what we see is happening to families today. The second uh, argument uh, is, after seeing the interrelations between globalization and borders, is that we have to move away from the traditional notion of family law to families' laws. Not only because the plurality of families, but because families are not affected only by family law, that is marriage, divorce, child custody, child support, but also from citizenship law, immigration law, labor law in their country, from laws in other countries because the family is now divided in more than one country, as well as from international, regional law, and subnational law, as we saw in the case of Muslims in the UK. So in the book, I'm moving through the familial life uh, cycle. I'm, I'm starting with discussing the challenges of coordinating familial expectations when two people are coming from two, two countries, to religions, to tradition and understanding of families, and the, the conflicts that may arise when a couple is immigrating to a, another country that has different law about family. Then a chapter on transnational reproduction services. I'm looking at the movement of Irish women traveling to the UK for abortion, an issue unfortunately becoming more and more relevant these days, and Israelis traveling to India for transnational surrogacy. A whole chapter on citizenship, because in our era of border globalization, citizenship is a major resource, if not the most important one. Our life chance, chances are dependent on the question in which country we were born more than any other factor. Then feeding children, which is the chapter I will explore here today. A chapter on familial violence, the dark side of families. So it, for example, question should a country receive a woman as a refugee because she ran away from abusive relations in a country that won't protect her in any way, but also how should we, we treat a male circumcision? We know that in Germany, for example, they're not so keen on this practice, um, but also child beauty pagans that are so popular in the US and I would argue are also violent, violence within the family. And finally, old age, which is, with, which is the issue I'm studying today, more than in the past, as I age. I'm also always studying what, I, what is, when I was single, I studied singlehood. When I got married, I studied divorce. Now I'm, <laughs> now I'm studying old age. Um, and this chapter looks at um, a very popular solution for old age in Israel, and that is importing someone who would care for that person from other countries, and it relates also to things that we will see uh, when we're talking about children. <coughs> so the chapter that deals with um, hungry children and solution for, for child hunger in, 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 in the global south. And here you can see pictures, I hope 
I hope you can see them, yes. Um, it's, it's a very interesting project. You can see some of the pictures online. It's a book called Hungry Planet that Peter Manzel and Faith De Lucio uh, wrote together. They traveled all over the world and they asked families to go to the market or the supermarket and buy the food they're eating within a week. And they, they took a photograph of the whole family where they're living and all of the food and how much it costs. So here, we don't have to, you know, really enough time to hear from you, but it's very obvious, right, that we have a variety of, of you know, kinds of families with nuclear families, extended families, single mother families. Um, the amount of food, the kind of food, junk food or healthy food, that is unfortunately much more expensive. Um, and we start to see here the division between the global north and the global south. So there are about 800 million people who are hungry on our planet currently. 98 of them are in the global south. Every 3.6 seconds, a person dies out of starvation, and most of them are children under the age of five. And this is before the disaster in Yemen that is taking place right now. So the question is, what are the solutions? And I'm, in this chapter, I'm looking at three possible solution. One is that the parent will leave and send the money back home. The other is that the children will go and work. And the third is inter-country adoption. And we'll start with remittances. So according to the World Bank, in 2014, four, $427 billion were sent by citizens to their home country. That is compared to $137 billion that rich countries sent to poor parts of the world. So what we see here is what Carol Adelman calls the privatization of foreign aid, in which the role of governments, of international uh, organization, is replaced by private money that people send home. And what struck me when I read the literature on remittances is that while there is an agreement that on the short term it's beneficial, money is sent, is used, there are arguments on the uh, outcomes for the long run. When maybe the brightest, the strongest are leaving their countries, communities are falling apart, and maybe the damage is greater than the benefits. But as a family law scholar, as a sociologist of the families, I was also struck by the negligence of the question, what happens to the children left behind? And what we see, for example, is that even on the economic level, there is no certainty that the children benefit from the fact that the parent immigrated. For example, sometimes no money is sent because the parent is in jail or couldn't find a job or the life costs at the country of, of, of destination is so high. So we are telling ourselves this narrative, oh, it's good for everybody. The children are better off when the parent is away, but economically we, are not, we could not be certain at all. And as to parental care, there are really hardly any, any data, quantitative or qualitative. But from the little that we know, and, and Zalaser Perenas will be here in Israel in, in, in June, she is among the few who went to the Philippines and interviewed Filipino children left behind. And what she shows, for example, is that the mother are absent for about 12 years, seeing the kids about 4.4 times for a few days each time. The fathers are absent for almost 14 years, visiting about 10 times during these years. So these are long-term absences. The parents are not there. So what happens to, their, to the children? And many of the children are voicing feelings of sadness, loneliness, resentment, 
or commodification of parental love. If the parent sends money, then that's, that's parental love. And I think this is the reason for concern. And in the book, what I do is I compare the discourse on children of, of parents who, who left them behind for, for send, to send money home and the discourse on children in the West whose parents divorce. Because there is similarity in the sense that the children can no longer live with both parents in the same household. And the comparison, I think, is, is striking. What we see here is that while, when, when we're talking about divorce, there is almost an obsession with the best interest of the child and how to keep both parents in the picture and fathers are important as mothers and joint physical custody and parents are not allowed to relocate as they used to in the past because the child has a right to two parents and special courts and special procedures to hear the child and what the child has to say and evaluation and studies on studies what happens to children when they're parents divorce, all that in the global north. In the global south, hardly any studies. We think that these children do not need their parents around. The best interest of the child is when the money is sent. No special procedures, no special permissions, no programs to assist these children. So what I'm arguing is that there is an interest on both sides, the sending countries like the Filipino encouraging its citizens to go abroad because this is how money is, is entering. And the receiving countries like Israel, unfortunately, who wants these people to work here, but not to have a family here. So they cannot come with their children. And if a Filipino caregiver give birth here in Israel, she will probably have to send that baby away because the elder person and his or her family would not allow them to live with the baby in the house 24 seven, right? So we are constructing two categories of children. In the West, children who need to be heard, who need to be studied, who need both their parents, and in the South, children that maybe are not children because do, they do not need all this thing. So I'm suggesting to look at this phenomena in a much more critical way. When we're talking about child labor, I'm suggesting to again reverse the moral gaze because maybe what looks like very troubling and problematic is here to stay and we have to think about it again. Unlike the children that are neglected in the discourse related to parental remittances, here, a lot of talks about how child labor is the greatest evil, must be abolished, must be eliminated. We see it in international law. Here we see a quote from the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We see it in, in, in campaigns, in NGOs. Everybody wants to stop child labor. But many think and many argue that this is not a true international consensus, but actually coercion and paternalism of the global north towards the global south. And what I'm doing in this table, I'm trying to summarize the pros and cons, this, this heated debate over child labor, and trying to suggest a fruitful dialogue between the two parties, because I think there are lessons to be learned both from the North and from the South on this issue. So those who argue that it's harmful, those who argue that it's beneficial, it's harmful if that's all the, the child is doing and no schooling. It's harmful if it's illegal, if it's dangerous labor, but it's beneficial if the child can assist in supporting himself, herself, the family, and learning the, the, the value of working. I am proud to say that my, both my kids work for pay from a very early age. I think it's part of, their, uh, of the way I, we are uh, training them for the real life. Not to mention labor at home. You know, there are so many kids today that won't even take their plate out uh, off the table. Among those who say that 
uh, children have to go to school and those that say that they have to work to survive. I'm saying let's look at for those children who have to work, how we do flexible schooling and part-time work, um, how we respect traditions that things that children not, don't only have rights but also obligation and the childhood and adulthood is a continuum and not these two very distinct periods of life. And realize that for many children there's no option not to work. So how do we assist them in working schooling and especially breaking the cycle of poverty. Finally, I want to say a few words about inter-country adoption and is that the, the key to, to our problem. And when we, talk, we see the statistics on inter-country adoption, we see, you see this diagram on, on the top, this is called in the literature the cliff. So we see a steady rise during uh, 2000. From 2000 to 2010, 410,000 children were adopted by intercountry adoption. That's uh, almost half a million children. What I'm doing in the book is I'm refusing to see this as this um, shared global phenomena first rich parents adopting uh, orphans, uh, then there is an international convention, the Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption in 1993, and because of that convention, the intercountry adoption stopped. I'm looking at each case study, I've chose uh, four case studies, and I will say a few words about each one of them. So the two major countries who sent children abroad for intercountry adoptions are not poor countries. They are China and Russia. So these are not cases of countries that could have not treated their orphans, or the, and in many cases, these are not orphans at all. In, in Russia, it's alcoholism mainly. 700,000 kids in, in Russia are in institutions because the parents cannot take care of them. In China, it was the one-child policy, right? And the preference for boys. So all these baby girls were there for adoption. So this is not the story about poor countries not being able to care for the kids. This is governmental choices of where to put funds. So in China, what happened is that the numbers decreased because the one-child policy was relaxed. Um, the, more Chinese were allowed to adopt those children that should have been adopted. And now we see that the few children that are adopted abroad are older. There are boys and girls, and there are many, in many cases, children with disabilities. The Russian story is, in my, in my, my opinion, horrible. What happened was that one day in 2012, Putin decided that no American will ever adopt a Russian child cutting procedures in the middle. So one story is that because the Russian public became concerned about cases of death and abuse in the states of few of these children, but the more convincing story is that the US Congress enacted a law against human rights violation in Russia, and this was Putin's retaliation against this law. The other case study is uh, the case of, of Guatemala. For many years, the United States was the only country that uh, was willing to receive children from Guatemala with thousands of Guatemalan children crossing the border. Other countries says no, said no, we won't take children because we're not certain they're not trafficked. We're not certain they are not kidnapped from their parents. So it took the signing of the International Convention by the United States and later on by Guatemala for the US to, says, oh, to say, okay, maybe there's a problem, we're not taking any more kids before you're arranging yours. So this is an example of how international law did affect the phenomenon and prevented child trafficking and child kidnapping. Ethiopia is, is the fourth and interesting case study in which you would have ex expected many other African countries contributing children to this inter-country adoption movement. But in many 
countries in Africa, the conception is that they are better off in their country, with their communities, with their people, even if it's an institution, even if it's an extended family. Ethiopia was the exception to the rule, but even Ethiopia soon realized that it's losing control and that because money is involved, children are kidnapped from their parents, children are trafficked, so they diminish the phenomena and try to control it better. So here I have a very complicated table which I will not go over, but you see I'm, I'm mapping the pros and the cons of inter-country adoption, but I'm refusing, not like in the, the previous table, to offer this third dialogical column because I think that in this case we cannot offer an answer that fits all circumstances. It has to be with a specific diet between the sending country and the receiving country if we want to serve the best interest of the children. So the, the discussion goes over what is in the best interest of children, how do we prevent child trafficking, is the right to identity is so important as some African countries think or are there more important uh, um, rights, uh, should political considerations be an issue and, and in what ways, uh, what, is, what are the local arrangements and how they should affect this decision, economic consideration and international regulation. But again, what I'm saying is that we have the convention, should we promote inter-country adoption or not, depends on what happens in each and every case, in case study and country. To summarize, I think that this chapter and the book as a whole points on how huge the challenge is if we want to secure children's right to minimal and maybe, let's dream, adequate standard of living while securing their and their biological parents' right to family life. What I'm arguing in this book and in later papers is that this, the discussion of the ethic of global border markets cannot be disconnected from families. It's not only about money, it's not only about cooperation. Family, family members, family life must be brought into the table. For example, immigration cannot be understood detached of family and family interest and rights. People immigrate first and foremost because of familial interest and, and wishes. So if we treat immigration as this individualistic phenomena, we're missing the point. We have to think outside the box if we want to shape the law in a humane way that take people's familial life into consideration. How about open inter-country adoption in which the child doesn't lose in her or, or his identity, keep knowing the family, going and traveling, the parents can have, the biological parents can have connection. Maybe one day that child will send remittances and not force other parents from the same community or family to leave the children behind. So this way of, and again, the book is not about easy answers. The challenges are huge. It's about realizing how we have to integrate family and family interest into our discussion. And as I hope I, I convinced you, we should all have global bordered responsibility that should be employed with contextual sensitivity. Thank you very much.